learn the language of your sales and marketing teams and use that to help define what they need and go out and get the data for that. Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal to stand in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for on eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts. Cost 15 times the price. Today's podcast is sponsored by Jennings Executive Search. I had a great conversation with John Jennings about the skills needed in different pricing roles. He and I think a lot alike. If you're looking for a new pricing role, or if you're trying to hire just the right pricing person, I strongly suggest you reach out to Jennings Executive Search. They specialize in placing pricing people. Say that three times fast. Welcome to Impact Pricing, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the financial relationship between them. I'm Mark Stiving. Today, our guest is Steve Rosevold. And here are three things you want to know about Steve before we start. He started out as an accountant, but he quickly moved into finance where the big bucks are, working his way up to a CFO. Uh, 17 years ago, he started and still runs a company that coaches CFOs at small to mid-sized companies. Four years ago, he started CFO University a new way to help CFOs grow. Oh, and by the way, he loves cycling and once rode 275 miles in one day. My butt hurts thinking about that. Welcome, Steve. Oh, it's great to be on your show, Mark. Thank you for that. Uh, The big bucks, okay, I I like that. I'm going to go look right at my bank account right now and (laughs) make sure it's all still there, but uh, it's great to be on the show. Oh, good. Glad to hear that. Glad. So I almost always ask the question, how did you get into pricing? But I really can't do that to you because you're not in pricing. (laughs) So so instead, what I want to do is is talk about CFOs today. And I want I want to learn more about them and how they think. And hopefully you can as well uh, can share that with us. Before you met me, how did you think CFOs thought about pricing? You know, I think um, certainly in the past, and and frankly, when I was uh, the last CFO job I had was seven or eight years ago, um, and and you know, it's a cost plus. It's looking at margins. CFOs have been focused on the cost side of the business and the margin side of the business. So they look at the top line, but only in relation to to the margin. And I think uh, when we first met not long ago, the whole idea of value pricing is really interesting. And it's something the CFOs, as they travel through, you know, having a more valuable contribution to their companies, are having to understand pricing from more of a perspective than just cost plus or an hourly rate or even fixed rate. And so that's what really attracted me um, to your work uh, at Impact Pricing because you really preach the value of pricing and how to increase it. And I think that's a great place for CFOs to start um, adding and increasing their value to the companies. Well, I certainly agree with that, of course. We published an article on CFO University on your site, uh, what, two, three weeks ago now, something like that? Yeah. Have you heard anything different from CFOs? Have they uh, have they gotten excited? Have they said, hey, this is a way I want to think in the future? I, I think almost totally it's been a positive. Where the, where the hard part comes in is how do we do it? This value-based pricing, how do I have an influence on that and how do I... Um, create that value for the company. So yeah, it had very positive, but the question mark remains for the CFOs and you hit it on on the head. We're very focused on cost. We maybe don't understand value well enough when it comes to pricing products and services. So the, um, that's where the quandary for us, you know, we want to get there. Um, we're not sure how. So that's why I'm so excited to have you as part of uh, our, one of our contributors at CFO.University because you can teach, I think, so much to our to our members in the CFO community at large. So um, a very popular article. People, they want to be able to create that value and help companies influence uh, in a positive way. And so it was really, um, really positive from its acceptance. Now there's the big education piece. How do we get there? Yeah, I find it interesting because I think CFOs are are such an ideal place for pricing uh, to penetrate a company because of all the influence uh, that CFOs tend to have and because they care about margin, right, so much. And so it's just a fantastic place. But I never thought about, I guess that's not true. I did think about it a little bit, but I never realized 
how hard it would be to get CFOs to adopt this. And, and I think if you can get them excited, then we can find a way to educate them. Yeah, I th- I, no, I think so too. And that's going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be a process. And, you know, as you point out in the article and in our conversations, the concept, you know, where CFOs spend their time I and mean, we spend our time in putting together balance sheets and income statements, very fixed, very firm. There's an end result a lot of times. And so breaking away from this concept of having a finite result is also, I think, helping us, will help us get into the concept of creating value, whether you have to have more optionality and you have to take some more risks, you have to take, be, do more experimentation. And I think, uh, and I don't, I don't, I'm not the expert in that, you're going to be the expert in that. But I think, um, so some of those shackles that hold us back from being really creative and innovative, um, we have to take off those shackles when it comes to, you know, having more of an influence and more of a positive influence on pricing. So, so do you think that's the reason why CFOs don't do pricing or don't emphasize pricing today? Yeah. By that, I mean the the risk aversion? No, I don't think it's the risk aversion. I think it's been left. So sales and marketing. So I don't think in, in a couple things. Sales and marketing have been the... Um, kind of the the creators of products, they have tended to be, well, what can we sell this at? So they've kind of, I think the CFOs had, have let them have their way in that. And, and, and the CFOs had looked at more from a margin standpoint. So they've said, okay, if we can make a 30% margin on this, our overheads are X, we can get a return for our shareholders, that's fine. So they've kind of got to a point where they've used a financial equation to say, okay, that margin works for us, that price is fine. And I think that's what you're exposing the potential to say, let's not look at the margin. Let's look at the price. Maybe the margin should be forty-five percent, and so I think that's that's one area where um, I think the CFOs have kind of in in their past as a as a control function, as a governance function, as a recording function, all those things that are a bit more historical and a bit more um, you know A plus B you know or one plus two equals three. That's that. And I don't think pricing has that same concept. So I think there is some breaking of those shackles. Um, but I would I would say one thing: there are some um, companies I'm familiar with that that, and I don't think you'd agree with this either. They have their CFOs approve the prices. So you know there is cases where when the, in a real control environment they're approved and, and they're doing it from the standpoint of are we making the margin we can make, not from are we getting the value we should, but are we making the margin we can. So. Um, there is places, but they, they, I don't think we're approaching it from the right right position. Yeah, I don't think it hurts to have a CFO say, yes, this is okay pricing, as long as in their mind, their rule is, are we making a decent enough margin, but not, is this the lowest price we can go, right? right? So, so it has to be at least X or 20% margin or whatever the number is going to be, or we why would we be in this business? But But- what I think often happens is the CFO says, okay, we need 50 points of margin, right? Our investors expect 50 points of margin. And they tell the entire company, we need 50 points of margin. Well, that just becomes the plus in our cost plus, right? Because I don't have to think about my pricing anymore. I know what my price is going to be. It's going to be 50 points of margin. And, and I don't think it's a nefarious, a hey, cost plus is the right way to go do pricing. I think it's just we need 50 points of margin. We tell the company that, and that's how the company behaves. Does, does that, that make sense so to you? True. That is, ex- that, I think that is a formula at a lot of companies, right? The CFO said we need this. And then for a sales department, that becomes a, a benchmark. And if they have a great product and, they're, and it's an easy sale, that's great for the salespeople, right? They're going to make their commissions. They're going to sell a bunch more product um, at a margin that, that it, it makes it easy for them try to get that extra 15 or 20 points, um, that's hard work, right? So you, the, I think you're, you're, uh, you really hit the nail on the head that once we've established that, well, this is kind of the minimum margin, that becomes the margin, right? We yeah. have to make this. And, and I think that's what we have to break away from. And then we're, we're frankly, lear- so you know, learning about how to test the value rather than you know, set this margin, that's the part that is, is really exciting, I think, for... Uh, for us, for the, yeah. the finance uh, teams. I want to come back to that in just a second, but I want to take this conversation in a completely different direction for just a second. And that is margin has two sides to it, right? There's a revenue side and a cost side. How involved do CFOs get in cost management and in cost reduction initiatives? 
I mean, I think that's been the a, the big focus, right? So when I talk about it, they feel that's what they can control the most. That's been their kind of their um, their bread and butter for years and years is understanding the cost side. And so that becomes, I think, where they're, that's a focus. And that's part of the problem is if they look at, hey, I want, we need to increase margin to, you know, 20%. Um, they go and say, we've got to reduce cost 20%. Well, maybe that margin can come out of the top line, not, not the cost side. And so I think, I think you hit the nail on the head there too, that they, uh, CFOs in general, that's it. That's our domain. You know, the cost part has been our domain in the past. Um, and that's, you know, really from a, from a control aspect, making sure that the costs stay in line is that they're, re- and they're really good at it. CFOs are really good at that. Um, but the peril of really learning about, you know, value-based pricing and all the, uh, you know, all the lessons that you are teaching, uh, you know, professionals. So it's interesting. And I'm thinking out loud with you here, Steve, so, so don't hold this against me. Right. But it's interesting to me that. I would bet CFOs aren't experts at reducing costs either. And I say that in the following sense. They can't go to the manufacturing floor and say, oh, we need to replace this machine with that machine because it's going to take costs out. Instead, they go to operations and say, we need to take out 20% 20 of our costs. How are we going to do it? I think that's, yeah. yeah. And they expect them to do the work, but they're monitoring, pushing, trying to make sure it happens. Um, I would push back a little bit on that, Mark. You're right. The technical parts, we don't know. But as far as, as understanding the cost structure and being able to show people what that cost structure looks like, I think CFOs are really good at that. And so that doesn't mean that they don't need help to get those savings. It's not going to be, you know, and I and I don't know, you know, in, in troubled times, so right early on in COVID, there was mandates, right? We have to cut costs 20% or we're not going to make it through six months. So there were some mandates, but normally... Um, and we certainly teach this at CFO.University, that it's a collaboration. You know, what the CFOs are doing and their teams are shining bright lights on the cost structure and hopefully the revenue side as well. But let's say it's a cost structure and able to work with the operations team, the marketing teams, the, even the human resource team and say, you know, how does this fit in to what we're producing, the value the company is creating? So our enterprise value is X. Um, here's the resources we're using for this. You know, how do we make that work? So I think where where the CFOs add the value isn't that they know to get the new machine. They're able to explain where the cost structure is, and and in a way, um, if they're if they're good, they're able to explain the cost structure in a way that those other de- departments are able to say, hey, we can have savings here, here, and here. So the details, you're right, that's going to be left to the different departments. But you know, the whole uh, the whole strength of the CFO is being able to communicate that in a way that those people can make the right decisions and help help along the way. Okay, so that was an absolutely fabulous answer, because what I wanted to do with with whatever answer you were going to give me is say, could we then take that and apply it to pricing, to the revenue side instead of just the cost side. And so instead of saying finance people have to be the experts in the details, can they understand and explain the structure to the rest of the company at a level or at a point that says, oh, yeah, we're not doing this well enough or we could be improving there. So things like watching ASP trends, right, things like watching segments and which customers pay us a lot of money and which customers don't pay us much and why does that happen and and what industries are really effective for us? And where, where's our win-loss ratio relative to all these things? Now, these are awesome things for, for pricing people, business people to understand. And I think finance could drive those. You know, I think we, and I think you're right. And I think in the past, I, there's a closer relationship on the vendor side frequently um, the, to, a, to a CFO than the customer side. And that's the shift that I think we're seeing more is, the, all the data on invoicing and receivables and purchase orders and and even getting involved in the sales funnel, understanding what's working, what's not, is all. And, and one thing CFOs do a really good job of um, is collecting data. We we can get better at then using that data to analyze things. And that's, I think, what you're hitting on, Mark, is that how can we supply information on customers who pay on time, customers who are troubled accounts, customers who order, you know, twice during the month when this happens and once during the month when this happens, you know, what, how do we, how do we help our, um, our sales and marketing teams, you know, understand the behavior of our customers so that they can then take the right action, whether that's a pricing action or maybe even a volume action. Um, 
you know, they have, they have the tools to do that. So I think that that whole um, customer journey that the finance teams can get can help a lot with the data they have and help influence um, and and really give insight to uh, the marketing and the pricing and uh, and marketing teams. I think that's absolutely true. Now compare and contrast. Boy, don't you hate that question? Would you compare and contrast these two? <laughs> but but compare and contrast the answer you just gave me with what they really do with the cost side, because isn't it the exact same thing? Yeah, you know, it should be, right? It should be. But and and I'm and I can say this from experience, so shame on me. Um, but the cost side is just it, it it's it's been in the DNA for the finance people. So it's whereas thinking about customers has been in the purview. And if you think about a sales and marketing team, so this is maybe maybe my perception, but I, I think it's fairly true. Sales and marketing team in a lot of companies have a lot of power, right? They, and, and they should. They're, they're facing the customer. Um, purchasing and procurement, the vendors are kind of like, hey, we have to live with them. We're going to try to get, you know, we're going to try to buy things as cheap as not, but our customers are golden. So there's, there's, I think, a little bit of this sense that the sales and marketing teams need to be left alone to do their own thing um, on the cost side. So I think that that kind of... Um, uh, attitude, uh, which is an old attitude that needs to be broken down, creates this dynamic where they're, you know, just it's harder to get involved with the sales and marketing teams. Whereas it has to be just the opposite, right? We have to be really willing to partner with those sales and marketing folks, help them with the information. What do they need? Go ask them. What? Can, how can we help you with this? And you know, one of the, if you think about sales and marketing, and it comes to, I think a lot of it comes to credit and things like that. So your, you know, your sales people want to sell on credit terms, and the and you know, all the finance team is trying to protect and they don't want bad debt. And and so there's that, there's a little bit of that. And you don't have that on the purchase side normally because you're the ones getting the terms on the purchase side. So there's that credit risk that always has become contentious between sales and finance. And and that's a place where that friction comes up. The salespeople want better terms. They want, they're rooting for the customer. They're trying to help the customer and the, and the finance people are trying to prevent, you know, credit losses and, and you know, working capital uh, crunches. And so there's been a kind of a contentious dynamic there where it really should be a very cooperative and collaborative. And then if we can, if we get to that point, now we've got this superpower being created, I think, between finance and sales and marketing that can really, uh, you know, boost value in companies. Yeah. So, so I want to go back to the, when I said compare and contrast, here's exactly what I was thinking. And, and so I want you to address this one directly. And that is, you describe the pricing side as how finance should collect data, analyze it and present it back in a way that says, hey, here's how we make sense of our markets. But isn't that exactly what they do on the cost side, where they're collecting data analyzing it, presenting it back to the company and say, here's how we make sense of our cost structures. No doubt. So I, the, the um, comparative piece that you're talking about, we don't do it the way we should be doing it right. in sales. Right. right. So would you compare? I, yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you that, that the way we do it on the, on the cost side is much more, you know, data and then we can get into the, the cracks of everything and who's taking discounts or should we be taking discounts on all that on the vendor side? We, we we just don't have the in my experience is we haven't had the same focus now i think that's changing mark i think and you're an example you know people i your your articles um they're you know they're just being eaten up because uh, by finance people because they find it such an area of potential growth and value for them so i think we're we're moving towards that you know where the comparative things will be much more equal whereas right now there's still a little bit unbalanced between you know the procurement side and and the uh, the sales side yeah. And, and I wasn't trying to imply they were doing pricing well yet. It was really just the, the concept of it's all about collecting and analyzing and presenting data and information. So the, the other thing I find fascinating is that you, uh, you think marketing and sales have a lot of power. And by the way, they do, right? They absolutely do. But I got to tell you, in most companies I've ever been involved with, everybody's terrified of the CFO. <laughs> <laughs> but they're terrified because of power. I'm not sure. Maybe they wield their power. Yeah, I mean, I think that. But, but that we and and there has there's a control function and a that I think CFOs will never that they'll have that. That will be the you know there'll be the chief control officer as well as some other things. I think that's what scares people is they're gonna they're gonna limit 
people from taking risk. And, and so that's the part I think scares people. Um, they also get to be in some situations, the, 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 the hatchet person, right? That big cost changes need to happen and it, it's kind of left on the CFO. So there, there's, there's kind of that history of, of um, you know, they, they, they give the tough love, right? So they're, I got to watch out for them. Um, but I think that the collaboration part is where, if we kind of look at it from both sides, what the CFO's skills are, and what the, the teams have all that data, all that analytic capabilities. And there's a, there's a gentleman, Andrew Codd. If I had, I, did I introduce you to Andrew Codd? If I haven't, he runs a data analytics team and he works with custom, he works with sales teams on customer success and, and new programs. And so, and he's a finance guy. That's kind of the, he's in the controller area for, for, uh, for Dell and fascinating how he partners with his sales team. So there is pockets where we're kind of breaking out and creating these really great collaborations um, where, where people are now coming to him. Salespeople are coming to, to Andrew and saying, Hey, can you do this for me? Can you do this for me? And, you know, and so it, instead of running when the controller shows up or the CFO shows up, you know, they're kind of running towards Andrew. So there's hope there. There's hope. Yeah. Uh, two thoughts. I posted an article on LinkedIn recently. Uh, it was about CFOs. And I actually got pushback from a bunch of CFOs, several CFOs. And they were saying, oh, we already do this. We already watch value. We understand value. And, and so maybe they don't to the level that I believe they should, but totally okay. And, and I'm okay with the pushback. And I just thought it was interesting that says, yeah, we're, we're doing some of that today. Well, can I comment on that real quick, Mark? Of course. Yes, because I think that I think the value. So yeah, if you say, Steve, you don't recognize value, you know, yeah, I want to reach out and punch in the face because I, I do see value. If I'm looking at another company and looking at value, I, I can see it. What, what I can't, what I don't think the value you're talking about is individual discrete prices for specific products and services that I agree with. And maybe if you aggregate that, that's the value of a company. But I think when it comes to buying and, you know, we, we have a lot of, um, a lot of background and, and, and you know, this from your, 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 the MBAs, I mean, you've got MBAs, PhDs, but the whole idea of, of, of looking at net present values and future cash flows. I mean, we're, we're, we're great at that. What we, and, but that's big picture looking at other companies when it comes to these discrete products that we're selling and trying to put a portfolio of products together that works. I don't, that's where I think that's the value. And I'm, I'm kind of putting words in your mouth. That's the value you're looking at. And I think CFOs aren't very strong in that generally, and there's an opportunity there. But when it comes to valuing a business that, you know, that type of thing, that's where I think people will be offended if they say you don't understand value. Yeah, I think the word value has tons and tons of meaning. And so we, got, we have to define them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, Steve, we are running out of time, but I am going to ask you the final question, even though you're not a pricing expert. <laughs> So what is one piece of pricing advice you would give our listeners that you think could have a big impact on their business? Well, remember, I told you I wouldn't answer any question for you that you asked that I could, didn't have an answer to, but I happen to have an answer to this one. Okay, so good. I, you know, I'm going to look at, I'm going to speak to my audience. So I, so in your audiences, uh, hopefully they can reap something out of this too. But I think from our, from the financial teams, speaking, learning to speak in the commercial language of their sales and marketing teams so that they can understand their needs and go out and, you know, be present with the sales and marketing. Ask, learn about what's important to the sales and marketing teams because then you can learn about what's important to your customers, right? And so using that to help understand what they need. And then we can get the data to help formulate insights against that and really help our sales and marketing team and create more of a collaborative relationship uh, that creates more value for the company and, and more value for the salespeople if they're getting commissions or whatever it is there, you know, more value for everyone. So it's really a, a big win. We're in the language of your sales and marketing teams and use that to help, you know, help define what they need and go out and, and get the data for that. Yeah, if you think about the role of the CFO and they're trying to, to manage the financial outcomes of the company, right? We do a good job with the cost side. If we, if we took the time to learn how could we help sales and marketing and product development too, by the way, right? But how could we help these companies or these departments be more successful? Then the whole company is going to be and we're going to look great. 
I agree with you. Uh, the one last thing, if I could, I'm squeezing out your time here, but uh, you know, this whole finance transformation, one of the things, one of the, the key aspects that we're teaching people is don't just look at the cost side of your financial, tra a transformation takes place when value goes up and costs go down. It's two, two levers and both have to happen. So we're really forcing finance people to really get on the value side of things, whether that's products or, or their services or, or systems or whatever, but um, it's really an important area. So uh, we're going to really enjoy learning a lot more from you mark over over the coming years excellent steve thank you thank you so much for your time today if anybody wants to contact you how can they do that you know our website is www.cfo.university so it's uh, really simple and i'm steve.rosevald with that url on the back so they can email me is great i'm easy to find on linkedin uh, but visit our website www.cfo.university perfect I you were the first company that I saw could get a dot university URL. I thought that was really neat. So we went I take no impact. credit for that. That was my marketing guy, but uh, thank you. <laughs> That's okay. We went out and got impact pricing dot university because of it. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Episode 121 is all done. Uh, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this, would you please leave us a rating and a review? And finally, if you have any questions or comments about the podcast or pricing in general, feel free to email me mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact. Thanks again to Jennings Executive Search for sponsoring our podcast. If you're looking to hire someone in pricing, I suggest you contact someone who knows pricing people. Contact Jennings Executive Search.